Hello and welcome back to another episode of Where to Become One. Today we're going to do another Come Follow Me commentary and this isn't necessarily going to be every podcast episode, although we're at two in a row here. It's just that when I listen to Jared Halverson's Come Follow Me, I think a couple of thoughts. One is this is too good. Um, it's not going to hurt anything to just repost him online because the more he can reach, the better. Also, his vision uh, and my vision are so aligned um, that it's almost like a lot of his words feel like my own anyway. And more importantly for Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians has some of the most important content of all time. And he's going to say that himself. Jared's going to say, you know, this is one of my favorite verses of all time. It's mine as well. I just couldn't miss the opportunity to do an episode for Come Follow Me because of Ephesians and some of these verses with Jared's commentary. So without further ado, let us begin. I want to prove a contrary here. And Paul, master at proving contraries. There's, he, he tries yes. to find the Goldilocks zone in, practice, in every principle. More proving contraries. And in this one, it. when he's speaking of grace and putting it in, in the context of just this overabundant wealth, okay, it's abounding toward us. Yes, it abounds. Yes, it's rich. But God distributes that in all wisdom and prudence. And that's... That's more of the justice side. That's the more of the careful accounting side. Yeah, I, I really wanted to play this clip just because I really liked those words that he used. We've spoken in previous episodes and he's spoken at length already in the New Testament about this balance between justice and grace and how when Christ's atonement was wrought, the preaching of the Jews, now Christians, from their forth was that salvation is through faith in Christ, not through the keeping of the law of Moses. But the law isn't done away. It's not like commandments are have are of no more effect, right? Christ said, "If you love you, if you love me, you will keep my commandments." So the commandments or the law, on some level, not the law of Moses per se, but law as a principle, right? As an if-then sequence. Um, the execution of which is justice. So it's not like justice is done away, but it's a um, it's a balance. And I like th the way he describes why a, a a God full of grace and mercy, whose atonement really can cover all separation and sin and transgression, it has the power to do that. So why hang on to justice at all? It has to do with distribution. And what is he distributing? He's distributing his likeness. A lot of times we think about grace as, well, God's distributing his grace to forgive us of our sins and wash us clean. But another aspect of his intention is not only to wash us clean so we can live in his pure kingdom, it's to develop us so that we become like him. We're not just returning to be with God, we're returning to be like God. And it's the distribution of grace in such a way and in such a manner, namely line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, is to grow us. The reason law and justice is still kept is to mature us spiritually to help us learn to be accountable. So you can't take away the accountability element just because Christ's grace is sufficient. Otherwise, that's a, that's a tool with which he matures us. I can cover everything, believe me. Exactly. Picture someone incredibly wealthy that still balances the checkbook, that still has a budget and makes sure that he knows where all the money's going to go. Well, I mean, how do, they, how do you think he got so rich to begin with? Okay, careful money manager. They, he uses wisdom in his expenditures and is prudent not to waste money, willing to spend it whenever it's necessary. Yeah. Okay? This is no cheapskate, believe me. But neither is he a spendthrift. It's the perfect balance. For our sake. To me, there's something, 
something beautiful about a Savior who knows how to perfectly balance justice and mercy so that we neither presume upon his grace nor fear that that grace is insufficient. And that can't be stressed enough, right? That his grace is insufficient. I mean, that's that's a killer idea in our church to think that his grace can't cover me, his grace can't reach me. No, 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 no. 100% it can. And also, he will hold you accountable. I am grateful for the Lord's wisdom. And what do I need to do to fully repent of my sins, to have that godly sorrow well up in me? God's wisdom is such that he wants us to be changed by the experience. And so, of course, the mercy is coming. Of course, the riches of his grace is going to pay all of that. But prudently, wisely, God is trying to help us become more like him along the way. Then verse 9 and 10, one of my favorite, this is one of the gems in chapter 1. Okay? Every chapter has its own gem. This is one of my favorites. 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, and, okay, well, what is it? <laughs> Explain the mystery. Please unveil it to me. Here it is, verse 10. And honestly, this verse has become one of my favorites in the past few years. Yeah, mine too. Often as I'm doing interfaith dialogue or working with people that are struggling in their faith or trying to reach across the aisle uh, with people that don't agree with me, this passage has come to mean everything. Ephesians 1 verse 10, this is the mystery of God's will. This is what he has good pleasure to accomplish and what he's purposed in himself to accomplish. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's the mystery. That's his will and his wish. It's his pleasure and his purpose. It's gathering. Now, when we think gathering, we probably automatically think the gathering of Israel. And that's a huge part of it. Gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. One of the most important works that we can do in this final dispensation. Mm -hmm. But speaking of the final dispensation, what else are we supposed to wrap up and put a bow on? This is it. Every other dispensation, not that they were procrastinating or kicking the can, but every other dispensation did have a later dispensation to, to do what they were unable to finish. Not us. We've got to accomplish God's work. And what is the work of this final dispensation? That's what, I love the way he's phrasing it. The gospel of Jesus Christ was restored in the final dispensation, the dispensation of the fullness of times. And as we saw in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, what's the, what is it that God really wants to restore? Yes, he restores church and restores priesthood and restores gospel. Yeah, but the things. scriptural restoration, according to section 84, is the restoration of his people. I'm trying to reconcile you to me. I'm trying to restore you to who you really are and who I predestined you, foreordained you to become. I'm trying to restore you to right relationships with each other, with, with relationships with me, I'm trying to fix all that's gone wrong. And in the final dispensation, that's when it, the work has to be accomplished. And it's a work of gathering together in one, all things. No wonder all the temple work needs to be done. No wonder all the missionary work needs to be done. No wonder when this dispensation comes to its full conclusion, which is thankfully end of the millennium. <laughs> okay, we've, uh, it's gonna, we're going to still be teaching the gospel and still doing temple work in the millennium as well. Yeah, right. But if you think about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, restored in these last days to restore God's people, then in some ways we are the custodians of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And what's our job? What is this dispensation assigned to accomplish? Which means, what are we assigned to supervise? The gathering of all things. All things. Not just scattered Israel. Everything. That's a tall order. And a mighty task. But the task is ours. 
Well, I agree that it's not just scattered Israel, right? When the church first was talking about the gathering, we were pulling converts from Great Britain, from the islands of the sea, and they were coming to Salt Lake City, and there was sort of this physical gathering. And now that's ceased, and we're told that there's still a gathering happening. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what that means, what that looks like, although President Nelson has been uber clear that that is the greatest work to be doing. I want to zoom out and mention that I agree with Jared. Um, I might even agree uh, with Jared m- more than he. I don't know because I'm gonna. I want to mention some things he just doesn't mention here, but I don't know his position on them. But I, I do emphasize what he emphasizes that it is our role to gather into one all things. In Christ, and he's talking about restoring us to that original place from which we fell. He's talked about the social gathering, right? The connecting, the bonding of of Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female, east and west, um, black and white, all of the things which appear to divide us, the things in our form, in our body, which appear to divide us. All of that is gathered back into what? its original state. Well, what is our original state? This is where we're going to be gathered back into. Um, In terms of us, what is our original state? Doctrinally, we know that before we inhabited these bodies, we were spirit children of God. And we lived with God in a pre-mortal state. Even before the announcement was made about this plan where we would come to a fallen world and experience division and the illusion of death before that plan was even announced what we understand is that there was some kind of unity that we can only long for at this time and work to get back to but there was no lucifer there was no fallen angel there was no satan there was no opposition to god's plan there was just a loving heavenly father raising his spirit children in a happy home a happy premortal home. But doctrinally, we also know that we were something before that. Before we were formed as spirit children of God, we were something. And this isn't uh, ultra clarified, but we were intelligences. And so we're getting back to that. I mean, think about individually, how do we identify when I use the pronoun I? I? or my, or me. I'm usually referencing my body. But isn't that kind of like last stage of development? Why am I only referencing that? When I'm using those pronouns, why am I not referencing the pre-mortal spirit body, the immortality, the immortal aspect of me, the part of me that never dies? Or why am I not referencing this intelligence aspect of myself, this unformed, creating, designing, intelligence it's still me right i'm still in possession of that or rather it's still in possession of these forms okay which is me why am i not referencing that when i'm using these pronouns is that part of the gathering is that part of the restoration my self-identification that process of coming to understand who i really am and living out of an awareness of that even in the way i use pronouns Another thing is is this planet, this planet on which we stand. Um, a lesser known but pertinent detail of this planet is that, think about even just back to the Garden of Eden, right? Um, the earth was not polluted. The continents were not divided. Will those things go back? Will the earth be restored? We know that... I don't know that that's necessarily our work, but the Lord and angels are going to come help us, but the earth needs to be refined, right? It's going to be wrapped up like a scroll. It's going to melt. It's going to be, I imagine that's part of the purification process for all the damage we've been doing to it, right? It's got to be healed. It's got to be sanctified. And ultimately, it's going to end up in this um, this glass sphere, right? A, a, a living Urim and Thummim on which 
celestialized bodies dwell. President Nelson spoke yesterday in general conference about the fact that our bodies are resurrected at different luminosity, telestial, terrestrial, and celestial. The planet, though, is going to be celestialized. So people whose bodies are resurrected in a celestial state with that higher brightness are going to be living on the planet itself. Listen to this. Um, this is Joseph Fielding Smith. This new heaven and earth, which will come into existence when our Lord comes to reign, is this same earth with its heavens renewed or restored to its primitive condition and beauty. Primitive. Think back to the Garden of Eden. All things will be restored. And Christ's atonement affects the planet and the plants and the animals, not just the humans. Everything is to be brought back as nearly as it is possible. Why might it not be possible? Well, one reason is the agency of man. Like President Nelson said in yesterday's conference talk, the fall of 2023, we're restored or resurrected in bodies in varying degrees. So everything is to be brought back as nearly as it is possible to its position as it was in the beginning. The mountains are, we are, let me move on to the next one. This is Brigham Young. When the earth was framed and brought into existence and man was placed upon it, it was near the throne of our Father in heaven. But when man fell, the earth fell into space and took up its abode in this planetary system. This is the glory the earth came from, and when it is glorified, it will return again unto the presence of the Father, and it will dwell there. And these intelligent beings that I am looking at, if they live worthy of it, will dwell upon this earth. So with Adam and Eve before the earth fell, the planet was literally closer to the throne of God and it fell away from that throne. So the fall, I, I lo and I love that bit of doctrine because it helps me just visualize this original point, right? Think of the grand design, the circle with the horizontal line in the middle and marker point A. Marker point A is this original point. And it, that original point can reference an, a couple of different things. It could reference the earth in its paradisiacal state in the Garden of Eden, but it could also reference us as intelligences before we began inhabiting forms, first a spiritual body and now this uh, more temporal material body. So it could be us as an individual, it could be the collective and the planet, but this original point fell. So it leaves marker point A and it drops to marker point B. It's just this fall. But it's not just a, a fall around the circle. Think of it like a, you could also think of it like an outward flowing spiral. Okay, or like if you're coming out, like you're blowing through a horn, right? This outward flowing funnel, like the, the exhale of the universe. Some um, scientists will say that this is really a more comprehensive visualization of of the growth of the universe and and how new galaxies are formed, but it's this outward flowing spiral from the Big Bang, which was the original point. Well, that's moving from marker point A to marker point B. It's, it's moving away and it's scattering simultaneously. So it's getting further from marker point A and it's getting further away. That's what makes this outward expansive spiral. Well, all things will be restored back to that point. And the doctrine is saying that not just us spiritually and socially, yes, that's included because we are a part of this material realm, but marker point B, that lower half of the circle, constitutes the material world or f the world of form. Everything above the circle, marker point A, at least in this relationship that we're discussing now, uh, would constitute the immaterial or the spiritual. So this, this whole second half, which includes the planet, the plants, the animals, and us, and including our ecosystem, how we get along, our political systems, our communities, our families, all of that, is, is breaking, it's dissolving, it's 
it's just a continuous repetitive cycle of dis of of dissolving that's what the human predicament is is that we've never been able to establish world peace we're just constantly repeating wars and civilizations rise and they fall through not just war but also famine and disease like just the whole system is set up to be fallen and that all of that all of the material realm is going to be restored and the proof of that jared will talk about in a minute is the resurrection of jesus christ and if christ can do that with the material world he can do that with our spiritual fallen state as well this doctrine is super expansive and um yeah let's move on to me there's something again like i said with interfaith dialogue what am i trying to do i'm trying to gather friends of other faiths into an understanding of one another as i work with friends in the lgbt community i'm trying to understand where they come from as i work one-on-one -on -one with people who are thinking of leaving the church or who already have I'm not trying to shame them into returning. I'm trying to understand where they're coming from. Because somehow I have to gather their perspective and experience back in to Christ, gathering all things together in Him. Think about that. The episode I was going to do before I listened to Jared's Come Follow Me podcast and realized that these important verses were in Ephesians was a podcast on Byron Katie. And Byron Katie is a woman doing work worldwide that I think really fits this description of gathering perspectives. She does this incredible thought work where people who are suffering come to her and they've put down a lot of their thoughts about the situations that they think are causing the suffering on paper and then she asks them to read these thoughts and then she has she inverts these thoughts and this process of inverting thoughts kind of gathers into one all perspectives because it turns out that the thoughts that are creating our suffering are these really acute polarized ideas and by inverting them, you basically jump all the way to the polar opposite end of the spectrum of possibility of that line of thinking. And it sort of gathers and wraps together. Of course, the ends of the spectrum are actually the same point, right? It's, it's the circle snipped and pulled into a linear fashion. That's how you get the spectrum. But when you can abide at both ends of the spectrum simultaneously, that's really sealing both ends back into one. That's how we um, gather, how do, I wish I could say this better, but that's really how we gather things into one within our own body and soul, ideas, principalities, powers, the invisible world, all of which exist on these spectrums, right? Um, when we can abide at the ends and hold two opposing ideas at the same time in our body and navigate life with them both present and fully aware of both simultaneously, then we're never caught off guard again and um, there's no more disruption within us because we're not ping-ponging back and forth between these two sides we've got it wrapped up into just one thing within ourselves. Katie is just the master of, of this, I think, on the planet at this time. And I'm very excited to do a podcast episode about her, so stay tuned. If you, I remember this hit me once. I may have even mentioned this when we were studying it in the Doctrine and Covenants. When it describes this earth becoming the celestial kingdom and becoming a sea of glass and fire, a Urim and Thummim in which all things are known, and it struck me, how do you make glass? Well, you take sand and you heat it to, the, to such an intensity that it begins to, to form into this transparent glass. 
Think about the sands of the sea. Think about the earth itself. But again, the way the Abrahamic covenant describes it, we are those sands of the sea. We are the stars of heaven. The posterity of God upon the earth. Imagine every human being as a grain of sand with their own hopes and their own fears, their own experiences and their own perceptions. And if we're ever going to make this earth a sea of glass and fire, it will be the fire of God that is required to take every single grain and somehow through that brilliant glory fuse us and transfigure us until we become one, one great sea of glass through that fire. In order to do that, we're going to have to gather together. We're going to have to understand one another. I love that he, his mind goes to, his mind goes naturally to this doctrine of, of the earth becoming the sea of glass, which is found in the doctrine of in covenants. But then comparing us individuals to those grains of sand and that process which affects both. And I genuinely, you know, I think it takes a bit of humility to to understand that we are not just our bodies. And so, but our bodies are part of the earth. Our, our bodies really are just as much sand as the sand on the beach that we visit when we're on vacation. And so why wouldn't the process by which God changes the actual sands of the sea and the process by which he changes our physical form be identical. Um, I've talked about this before, but it actually really neutralizes a lot of my self-defeating stories to identify my bodily as- the bodily aspect of my soul as just another part of the planet. Um, and even the automated negative thinking, even those, ne- the reason those negative thoughts and stories are neutralized is because I just think, well, those are part of my body. There's a part of my brain that is designed to do that. It's designed to be fearful all the time. It's designed to protect me from bears. It's designed to spot everything that could harm me. It's designed to eat as much sugar and food and fatty things as possible to store up because this part of my brain is just this animalistic survivalistic element and I'm part of the animal kingdom and so when these and and the whole material kingdom though is understands itself through comparison right time is a comparison between this point and this point Space, measurement, if you talk about a yardstick, a foot, a meter, all of that is a comparison between this point and that point. And so socially, when we're comparing ourselves, we're comparing our finances, we're comparing our body types, we're comparing all of that whole process of comparison, which creates so much pain socially, is really just part of the material realm, which is literally known through comparison. So when I start comparing and creating all these sad stories i'm just like oh thank you animal brain that's just what you do you're part of the planet and that's what this realm does but there's another part of us that is not just the sand of the sea it's not just part of the material realm and i it's so exciting jared you really spark excitement What's amazing to me is, think about what we've been learning lately about presiding. And President Ballard has taught this repeatedly and powerfully. The job of the presiding officer is not to make up up his mind and make the decisions and then start delegating responsibilities to go go get my vision accomplished. No. That's that's the old model. And it's, it's not the right model. That's how the world does things. That's not how the Lord does things. So what's the model of presiding in the Lord's way? As the presiding officer, whether it's that the, the bishop of the ward council or the state president over the high council or the parent over the family council, what's the presiding officer meant to do? 
not make the decision and delegate the, the tasks. No, his task is to gather everyone's perspective. This is the principle of scattered revelation, right? God had the puzzle, but he broke it into pieces and scattered it across the entire council. Every member has some. And if I'm presiding, my job is to coax out of every member, give them enough confidence that they feel free to share their wisdom and experience and perspective. Their best thinking, their, be their, their spiritual gifts, since they all have one or more, and they have some that I don't have, and so we need each other, right? If that happens, then not only will we come up with the best collective decision, but everyone will have a stake in that decision. And it's not a matter of me delegating, telling them to do something to achieve my vision. They all want to come together to achieve the collective vision. It's genius. So think about, again, if the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is meant to preside over this dispensation of the fullness of times. What's my job as presiding officer? It's not to have all the answers. Rather, it's to gather out the answers from every group that has any, and all groups have some. It's a matter of assembling those spiritual gifts. That's why I'm so grateful to have holy envy when I do interfaith work. It's why I'm so grateful. Jared is, I feel like I am tethered to like a ton of helium balloons. And when I just get sort of taught into this topic about gathering and where to become one, which by the way is, you know, the tagline of my, my business, but also he, he says that like three times in this episode about two becoming one. Whenever I get into this topic, I feel like these balloons just like lift me off the ground and I, I can't even like put two words together anymore, like how that last comment ended. And then Jared like grabs my foot and pulls me back down and puts my feet on the ground and starts talking about like how this applies to a ward council. And I'm just like, oh yeah, that's why it matters. Like I feel that it matters because it carries me and lifts me and lights me up and gives me energy. And I'm, I come alive with the topic. So I know that it matters, but how does it matter and how to communicate that? Jared's just um, my best partner in that regard. So I want to comment on a couple of things that he said before I forget, because it's so easy for me to get carried away, but like, um, already it's gone. Grateful to have empathy and understanding and not, not pity, but rather, what have you learned along your journey that I have not? What gifts are you bringing to the table? Because our job in this church is to gather together all things in one in Christ. Every godly grain of sand. I need to hear your experience. I need to find out what it's like to live in your shoes. Reach across racial lines, reach across religious lines, political lines, class lines, gender lines, sexuality lines. It's, you name the grain of sand. God doesn't want to lose a single one. And we have to become more welcoming, more embracing, if we ever hope to gather all things together in Christ. I mean, this is what really matters. I mean, thank you, Jared, for saying so eloquently what really matters and in such a way that prompts me to change. I, I, the, back to the the presiding point. I have felt that struggle of thinking that presiding is, you know, having, getting everyone to do it my way. And that's the animal part of, part of my brain. Like that's sort of like the starting point and it's the world's way. It is the world's dynamic. Look at kings and political powers and throughout history like it's just you know Nebuchadnezzar and the Pharaoh and it's just these individuals whose whims must be obeyed and everybody operates based on fear and that's just how it's been and that's not 
And the reason it's been that way is because that's the way our bodies are designed. That's built into our bodily experience. And what part of what happens when our soul is gathered back is that we step out of pure identification with form and form functionality, including leadership dynamics. And we step back into what we were before that, our spiritual selves. We start living by the fruits of the Spirit. Our own body, our own soul undergoes this restoration. And as that occurs individually, it also begins to occur collectively. Um, The man-child, which is the kingdom of God being reborn out of these worldly kingdoms is nothing more than a collective phenomenon of individual man-children being reborn, where the our original aspect, our intelligence, our pre-mortal aspect, that isn't fallen, that doesn't view interactions with others this way, the part of us that loves naturally and loves like Christ, as that emerges from us, and becomes more and more evident in our daily life, individually, well, enough individuals do that, and then collectively you have this man-child that's mentioned doctrinally, which I'm sure he'll get to when we get to Revelations. But it's the daily struggle that really matters that Jared's so good at talking about. And um, I think it's interesting that even the brain... He, I think I what I would say is that this change in nature that he's talking about is really even a, a transition from point B back to point A for the brain itself with point B being the animal aspect of the brain and point A being the prefrontal cortex as more and more of my interactions are guided by my prefrontal cortex intentional living the ability to receive injury and not react with my animal fear-based brain, but shift up the ladder to the more godly aspect of my brain where my godly nature is manifest through the prefrontal cortex. Even that is a transition from B back to A in my own process of God's grace restoring me back to what I was originally. Originally when? Yes. All the way back to beginning of time and even before time began that is the one great whole and it's our job to make sure the world gets there okay you with me on this are we with the lord on this this is huge it's going to take the rest of this dispensation to pull it off but so much of it is a change of heart on our part so that we're open to those things instead of me just trying to force and fuse people into my perspective no, they've learned some things along the way that we, can, we don't quite get, okay? Bring it all together in Christ. Right, the change out there in the political landscape is affected by the change in here. The personal is political. That macro collective phenomenon of a new life, a new earth, uh, world peace, that's not going to happen out there it's going to happen in here and if it happens in here inside of enough souls then it will happen out there and that's the only way that's all the evidence you need the proof of god's power was made manifest in raising his son from the dead this is paul being a witness of the resurrection as usual and by bearing witness of the resurrection of jesus He's bearing witness of the power of the Father to raise life out of death. He did that physically with Jesus, but he's doing that spiritually with the rest of us. And though we have committed sins that are self-destructive, spiritual suicide is what every sin entails. But I trust the power of God. And the same power by which he raised his only begotten Son is the power whereby he'll raise every son and every daughter that's ever fallen into spiritual death. 
He just wants us to be raised together so we can sit together. Elder Maxwell once said to Elder Bednar, uh, I think at the time Elder Bednar was president of BYU-Idaho, and Elder Maxwell had come to speak and was talking with Elder Bednar and said to him, there is no atonement absent the character of Christ. And that blew away Elder Bednar. Blew me away when Elder Bednar told us. The character of Christ, Christ-like attributes, are what underwrite the atonement. It's his mercy and his love and his kindness that makes him want to reach out and reach down to us to lift us to his high and holy level. That's the Lord we worship. <laughs> Exceeding riches? Yeah, you better believe it. Remember what happened inside the temple when Christ spilled his final blood on the cross? When the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, this is God opening the door so that humanity can come in to his presence. Well, if that was happening inside the temple, what was happening outside? The veil separating humanity from divinity was torn. Well, the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile was being broken down as well. It's such a powerful image Paul is giving us. Tear the thing down. Tear down this wall. Before he moves into the political, I got to pause and agree that this is such a beautiful metaphor. And I'm going to go off here for a minute and I actually had another seven minutes of clips from him that I was going to comment on and I just don't have the time, Jared. Um, it, truthfully, if I just sat down with one of your full episodes and said everything that came to my mind, your five-hour episodes would turn into like 25-hour commentaries. And maybe we'll do that sometime. Maybe that'll be a fun thing. These principalities and powers which effect our rebirth, right? Our rebirth is the emergence of that man-child. And what is that man-child? It's the characters and attributes of Christ. He sires them in us. And as Christ-like characteristics emerge more and more from us, that's likened unto a man-child because it's a new aspect of our souls that's distinct and different from the animal aspect of our souls. It's godly, it's divine. And it emerges out of us as we receive from him. Well, these things, these invisible powers and principalities which effect our rebirth are found incarnate in the male and female form. And it's a beautiful thing that the process, even the components which effect birth, and the components, the invisible principalities, these, these things which effect our rebirth, they're perfect parallels. Think about the plan of salvation. Think again about the grand design, leaving marker point A, which is pre-mortality, and we come to mortality, which is marker point B, the material realm when we're on earth. Well, how do we transition from A to B? Through birth. And how do we transition back from B all the way back to A? Not some of the way, not to the celestial level or the terrestrial level, but all the way back with and like God. It's not death, which is, which is another transition in another story where you leave the material form, realm. It's actually rebirth. So birth and rebirth, that completes this A, B, B, A story of the plan of salvation. So isn't it well that birth and rebirth that there are pointers in the material realm to rebirth, since rebirth is so critical, there are pointers to rebirth. And those pointers are our reproductive parts in the male and female bodies. The way 
a male and a female interact, the way these parts interplay to create birth, they are pointers for things, invisible ideas like law, like grace, like choice or agency and consequence. These are pointed to these ideas which are pertain so intimately to our rebirth or lack thereof are pointed to by birth. And this comparison that he brings up about the veil and the temple is so much um, part of that because, because a veil is rent with every birth, including rebirth. There's this verse in Moses that talks about how Satan stands over the earth and covers the whole earth as with a chain. Um, another way I like to visualize that is, is this sort of amniotic sack of darkness, of temptation. And what effects that? That's the spiritual death, right? And what effects that? It's the law. Paul says this so much in the New Testament, that the law brings death. Because the law exists, and then we sin, there's spiritual death. But there was no way to avoid it. Everyone falls short of the glory of God. Only Christ escaped that spiritual death. And even he tasted what it felt like, not by his own sinning, but on the cross when, the, when he felt forsaken. He felt that. He knows what spiritual death feels like because he was forsaken in that moment, even though there was no point of reference to credit and say, aha, that's why he felt that. No, he felt that just for us. But for us, we feel that because of our sin, because of our transgression, because we ate the wrong fruit, right? There's always some point of reference to go back and give an accounting and say, well, we brought this upon ourselves. Christ didn't bring it upon himself, but it was brought upon him for us. But that, that experience, I'm getting sidetracked, but, but my point is, is the experience of spiritual death is like being totally cut off, right? That's what the law does. It totally cuts us off. And that's the visual of being totally enveloped, totally surrounded by darkness. We cannot get a spark of light, a breath of hope. We are completely ostracized from God. That is what doctrinally spiritual death is. And when Christ came and fulfilled the law, the law which created that experience of being totally enclosed, he opened up the possibility of life again. And life is like birth. When a child is born, it's literally beginning life. And that exact same thing happens for us spiritually. And that's why we call it rebirth. Every time you felt alive, it's because of Christ. It's because of this moment when the veil in the temple was symbolically rent. And why was it symbolically rent? to point us. It's just a material symbol for what does occur in the immaterial realm for us because of Christ, who is really the mother and mediator of all of the Father's children. It's through Him that we come back to the Father because He came and was with us and was present with us in the same way that a in a traditional home the stay-at-home parent, which is usually the mother, is with the children and the father is far off and away. And the children wouldn't even know so much that he loves them and cares about them if that stay-at-home parent didn't mediate and tell them stories and say, no, I, I'm just here as a, an emissary. I'm, I'm, I'm here working as one with your father who is outside of the home. Well, Christ came to our earth home to sit on the floor with us and be with us all the time. There's such a beautiful comparison to go on and on and on about stay-at-home moms 
and the role of Jesus Christ in his condescending to earth, whereas the Father didn't. The Father stayed on his throne, and there was a separation there that required a mediator. So much to think about. But this task of unifying. Oh, that was another thing that I wanted to say earlier in a comment that I got lost on was that um, he talked about, um, he didn't use the word organizing. What was the word he used? He's talking about in interfaith work and how you're taking these perspectives and you're piecing them together. Yeah, he talked about a puzzle. One of my favorite quotes is by a Teilhard de Chardin, this French scientist. He's, he says that um, um, the... Uh, it's in my book, but I don't know if I can say... Hey, there it is. The creative act is comprehensible only as a gradual process of arrangement and unification which amounts to accepting that to create is to unite. This idea of gathering and piecing things back together is a matter of organizing. And I love our doctrine that talks about Christ's creative power, how he created even the planets and the universe and the cosmos was a matter of organization. That's a word specific to our doctrine. I love it. I love our church. I love the work of our church. I love the work of Jared Halverson, and I love the work that I get to be a part of as well. Till next time, loving you.